Who in here is ready to hear the word of God? Awesome. So grab your Bibles and open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is uh, not part of a series, so this is just a random sermon that God placed in my heart. And I hope, I pray that uh, he speaks to you today. And, And you guys are getting a lot better, and I applaud you for giving feedback, for saying your amens, for um, just letting me know what you think about um, the message. And uh, yesterday, um, when my dad was preaching, he, he mentioned something that I didn't really think of. Um, in Revelation, I think chapter 1, it, it says how um, Jesus is amen. Um, how amen, what that means is, is truth, it is so be it. And when we say amen, we are proclaiming Jesus. So when we actually say amen, we have to say it strongly. Because if we say amen, not only are people around us going to hear, but the demons are going to hear too, which is awesome. Because we're going to be saying amen, which is Jesus. We're going to be saying that we agree with this truth. So, man, when I say something that really, that is really true for you, that you know is true, then I you know, encourage you guys to proclaim that out, whether it's amen, whether it's praise God, um, or whatever words you choose to worship him with. But um, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, um, and as you open up your Bible or open up the app on your phone, let's uh, thank God for um, this word. If you don't have a Bible, there, there's, there should be one in the front pew there in front of you for you to use. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for everything you've shown us this far. And you've revealed yourself. You've revealed your message to us. And it has been molding us. It has been changing us. It has been getting us more intimate with you. And Lord, your your word is a double-edged sword. Sometimes it feels good to hear it. Sometimes it's like honey to the taste, but at the same time, sometimes it's bitter. Sometimes it's tough to swallow. Sometimes it's tough because it convicts us of sin. It convicts us of things that we need to change. But Lord, I pray that today you can speak right to our hearts. That any preconception we may have of you, of the Bible, may just be done away with that you can have your way with us, Lord, today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Um, Today we're going to talk about a very serious topic. And if you know me, I'm a very um, fun, humorous guy. I I love making people laugh. Um, But today... Is uh, this this message is very very serious and, and and I mean serious not as in like everyone's like this but serious as in um, we need to hear it we need to listen to it um, and and this is the word of God so if you feel convicted by what's going to be said here today if you feel maybe guilty or if you feel anything like that know that this is the word of God this is the word of God speaking to you so whatever God put in my heart to speak today. It's not because it's my opinion or, you know, I want to do something that gets you irritated, but it's because God wants you to hear it. And you may be mad at me. You may be mad at the church. You may never come again, and I hope that doesn't happen. But just know that sometimes, like they say, truth hurts. But the truth, the Bible says, will set you free. So let's listen to the word today. From First Thessalonians chapter 4. I just want to give you the context here real quick. This is a letter that Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Thessalonica. And this church is awesome. If you read chapter 1 in this letter, they're an awesome church. Their faith just goes out all across that region in Macedonia. So it's like if our church, let's pretend we're their church. If, so it's like if our church was here and all of Lehigh Valley knew about us and knew about our faith and the things that we are doing, and the lives that are being changed, that's this church. This church is awesome. They love other churches. They love unbelievers. They they just love. There's so much love. And and, if you read a whole letter, you will find that out. They had a lot of faith. So um, we come to chapter 4, and we're going to read the first half of this chapter. 
So um, can someone give me a water, please? I didn't get it before. I will really appreciate that. So verses 1 through 2, it says this. Finally, then, brothers, we ask you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Okay, first of all, he starts with the words finally. Finally. When do people usually use that word? We use it when we're concluding something, right? Like finally, in conclusion, but here he's not really concluding anything. This is what's happening. He's preparing the people for an exhortation. What's an exhortation? It's something that we urge someone to do. He's urging you to do something. So in the first three chapters of um, First Thessalonians, he's saying how awesome uh, this church is. He's talking about how you guys are my pride and joy and how I want to see you again. And, and he's just really happy. But then he says, finally, now that you know how I feel about you, now I'm going to tell you guys how you must live. I'm going to urge you guys to do something very important. So Paul makes it very clear that he's not saying anything new. He says here, um, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing. This church was already walking with God. But, so he makes it clear that you guys know this already. You guys know how you ought to walk with God. That's not, I'm not saying anything new here. And guys, to be honest, that is what most sermons are like. The thing is, we forget really very easily about what we learned in church, right? I mean, sometimes not even like, where did I preach last week? You know, like I totally forget. We are forgetful people. So Paul here, what he's doing is he's remembering them about um, what they should be doing. See, I'm reading through the Bible um, who in here is actually doing the Bible plan? Raise your hand. Like trying, trying to read the Bible in a whole year. Okay, awesome. So, so you guys are probably going to be experiencing this too. Um, right now I'm in Deuteronomy. And I just feel like, man, the Bible is so repetition, of rep repetitive. The Bible has a lot of repetition. There we go. Okay. Had a lot of repetition. And um, so I'm reading Deuteronomy and it's repeating everything that happened in Exodus. And I'm like, oh, what is going on? Like, again? Um, but it's because the Israelites forget, forgot all that God had done. So you read Deuteronomy, and, and Moses is writing again. Like, don't you remember what God did for you guys? He took you out of Egypt. Don't you remember that big fire that came out? Don't you remember the Red Sea being split? Don't you guys remember that? So he's writing Deuteronomy. It's kind of like a summary of what happened with Moses and the people. So, same thing, sermons, many times you're going to come in here and you're not going to learn anything new. You're going to be like, oh, I know this, Tim, all right, yeah, you know. But we need to be reminded of those things. We need to remember what God is trying to tell us every day. And Paul is acknowledging that he knows they know this stuff, but he is still urging them to do it more and more. It says here, that you do so more and more. Everyone say more and more more and more that's what he wants us to do but do what walk and please God so Paul's message so far is this walk the talk he doesn't want Christians to be just people who who know how to talk about Christianity they know Christianese you know those people that know just know Christianese like the old language you know like, yeah, I've been sanctified by the Holy Ghost, you know? Like, they just know how to look and act like a Christian. But when it comes to walk the Christian life and please God, they, they don't. So he's saying walk the talk. But under what authority is Paul speaking? He says that in verse 1. Under what authority? In what? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's asking and urging in the Lord Jesus. In verse 2, the word instruction here, where it says, For you know what instructions we gave you. This word is a military term. When a general gives instruction to a soldier, that soldier has to obey. In the same way, Paul is using that word to say, You know what? I'm not the one that's telling you to do this. This is God commanding you. This is God saying, urging you to please him, to live a life that is holy. 
Paul is saying, this is big. This is not my own opinion. This isn't a favor that I'm asking you to do. This is what you must do. So he goes to verse 3 and he says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Everyone say sanctification. sanctification. This is the will of God. We all want to know God's will, right? God has many desires for us, but Paul here, he tells us one element, one desire that God has for your life, and that is your sanctification. So in verses 1 and 2, Paul is indirectly giving us a definition of sanctification. What is this word, sanctification? Sanctification. Five syllables. All right, it's a long word. What does it mean? To put it simply, it is the progressive process of being holy. What is holy? People go, oh, I'm not holy. You know, like, oh, I'm not a saint. If you're a Christian, yes, you are. Okay, I just put it out there. You are a saint according to the definition of holiness. Now, what is holy? Holy means to be separate. Holy is to be called out to be separate. Okay? So don't confuse this with regeneration. Regeneration happens when you first become a Christian. When you first make that step, when you raise your hand to accept Jesus as your Savior, when you come forward, when you, when you pray to God, say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, that's regeneration. That's when God changes your heart. He puts something in you like, man, I want this, Jesus. I want to be saved. That's regeneration. You can't do that on your own. God is the one who puts that in you. Okay? He puts that faith in you for you to change. But Paul is saying, hey, guys, you're all so awesome. You guys are awesome Christians. You guys, you know, have an awesome church. You guys are doing awesome things, awesome faith. But don't be content. I want you to do more. Don't be content. I want you to do more. Guys, I believe Satan likes it when Christians are content. Yeah, I already know about God's love. I, I know about it, you know. I'm good. Yeah, I already know about Jesus dying on the cross for me. You don't got to keep preaching that. I'm good where I am. Do we really, do we really believe in Jesus dying on the cross? Do we really believe that God is love? Because many times we say with our lips that we believe it, because, but sometimes we don't live our lives like we truly believe it, like we truly know that's the truth. Guys, being content with your Christian walk is to give yourself more opportunities to be weakened by sin and trials. Guys, being content with your Christian walk is to give Satan more power because he's, being around, because he's been around for a very long time. Guys, Satan has been around more than you and he knows how to make you fall. He knows exactly where you're weak. Being content with your Christian walk is like to get married with someone and be fine with living in separate homes and not growing in intimacy with each other. Being content with your Christian walk is setting yourself up for spiritual suicide. Do you guys believe that God is a healer? Amen. Do you guys believe that God is a miracle worker? But does God always heal? No, right? Does God always perform miracles? No. So I'm telling you guys right now, there are a lot of churches, a lot of ministries, many times on TV where we see that these Christians and churches are focusing so much on the miracle and the healing aspect of the Christian walk, but in their day-to-day -day life, you can't tell these Christians apart from non-Christians. See, it's not always God's will to heal, but it's always God's will for us to be sanctified. So don't keep seeking miracles. Don't spend all your time seeking physical health and healing. Spend your time seeking holiness, being separate, being different, because we all have an expiration date, my friends. That is the truth. We all have an expiration date. But as for me, I want to present myself to Jesus as a man after his own heart. 
Not a man that just looked after healing and looked after miracles and looked after those things. No, I want to present myself to Jesus as a man that was after his heart. We always want to know God's will. And we usually see God's will in pivotal moments of our lives, right? We want to know God's will to know what college we're going to go to. We want to know God's will to see the, the person we're going to marry. And we see God in those times. We want to see, know God's will when we, we're going to buy a house, when we're going to pick a career. But in our daily lives, we can care less what God wants. In our daily lives, we can care less if we forget to read the Bible the whole week. But if we read scripture, we discover that his will is for us to be sanctified. And that's a daily process. We might be going to God for the big moments in our life. But when he speaks, many times we're not listening. Why? Because we haven't been listening in the small moments in our life. See, guys, if we're not faithful in those small moments, why would, we, why would we be faithful in the big moments in our lives? So don't think that God is just a God who we can come to only in the big pivotal moments in our life when we need help, when we're surrendering. Oh, God, I need to help. Uh, you know, I need you to help me in this situation. No, God wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to seek him every day. He wants you to go before his feet every single day. Tell the person next to you, God wants you to be holy. So now Paul gives us some ways we can be holy. In verse 3, let's continue verse 3. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. <gasps> he said the S-E-X word. Sexual immorality. Why did he pick this one? That's my question. You know, out of all the ways to be holy and good before God, he picked sexual immorality. Maybe it was because it was an issue in this church. Or perhaps because the Gentiles, or Gentiles are people who aren't Jews. Maybe when they converted to Christianity, it was very tough for them to let go of their sexual habits, of their sexual sin. See, the Jewish Christians, they were worried that these Gentiles who converted into Christianity would not let go of their sexual sin. I mean, isn't it the same way today? Sexual sin is sometimes the toughest thing to let go. Many people argue and say, oh, Tim, it's a cultural thing, man. Those things change. In time, things are always changing. What was wrong back then isn't wrong today anymore. No, 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 I disagree. Why? Because back then, prostitution was a normal thing. But, but why is it illegal today? I mean, if it was right back then, shouldn't it be right today? Back then, it was okay to use your slaves for sexual gratification. But why would that be wrong today? I mean, isn't it a cultural thing? I mean, shouldn't it be the same? See, guys, that is why we need a standard. We need a standard, and that is the word of God. See, if we depend on our culture to tell us what's right and what's wrong, how we should live, how we should get married, how we should, you know, treat sex and all those things, we're going to go all over the place because one day, prostitution could be legal. And everyone's going to be like, oh, prostitution is fine. It's okay. It's not a sin. And we can be in that rut for, forever, thinking, oh, let's, you know, let's have MTV define what is good sexually and what's not. They know about it, right? Wrong. See, the word of God is unchanging. The word of God is unchanging. Who believes in that? Amen. It's unchanging, guys. It, it is God's holy words. So if we, we're always going to be looking at, you know, the society to define what is good and true, then why, why do we even read this? We can just put this aside and be like, all right, let's listen to society, let's listen to the schools, let's listen to, you know, the Grammys, let's listen to MTV. Let's look, because, you know, they know more than what God knows. Guys, God created sex and he knows the best way to use it. 
Just like when you buy food or snacks, what is something that's always on the food or snack? A date, right? There's an expiration date, or some of them even has a best buy. So like, this is best by October 2014. Right? So you wait till 2000, so you wait till October so you can eat whatever that thing is. Sex has written on it, best by marriage. Right? Sex has written on it, best by marriage. Now my other question is, is homosexuality a sin? <gasps> he did not just say that. Yes, I did. Okay, is homosexuality a sin according to the Bible? Yes, right? But this is the thing, guys. So is sleeping with your girlfriend. Okay? So is looking at porn. See, I don't like to single out homosexuality and say, oh, this is a huge thing. No. See, sin comes in different shapes and different forms. But do I sway the truth because of what society tells us? Because of what society tries to justify? No. Because back then, prostitution was okay. Back then, it was fine to do many, many sexual acts. And they thought it was fine. But God said, no. Paul is saying, abstain from sexual immorality. Guys, I stand with the word of God. If I get put in jail for preaching it, so be it. I'd just be like Apostle Paul. Right? Right? But this is the thing, guys, talking about this whole subject. Each and every one of us has a desire. Each and every one of us has a sexual or sinful nature in us. But we can't let the world define if it's okay or not. See, while someone is struggling with homosexuality or maybe uh, they're a pedophile or maybe they're just you know, a perv or maybe they're, they're cheating on their wife, Those are different struggles for different people, but it's all sin. So we can't let society say one day, oh, no, it's okay to cheat on your wife. And they're pretty much saying that. Oh, just get a divorce. It's okay. You know, it's okay to have sex with someone else. And people are like, all right, that's fine. I'll just sleep with different people. And they think it's okay. See, that's a sinful nature that needs to be dealt with. And and, And I promise you guys, only God can really change that. But then he gives us three points about sexual sin in verse 4. Through five, he says this that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. They learn how to control his own body. Okay, so let's go through these three points. One, the first thing is this you're not an animal. All right, tell the person next to you, you're not an animal. He's saying, you need to learn to control your body, okay? Many times, people don't want to believe in a God because they don't want to be held responsible for their sin. So what do they do? They believe in things like evolution that says we're all like animals, and that's exactly what they become. They become animals. No control, no boundaries, no limits at all. Now, my dog Ziku is an animal, And he'll hump your leg. And he doesn't care who you are. If you let him, he will hump your leg. And why? Because he's a dog. He's an animal. But we are not dogs. We are not animals. We are people that were made in the image of God. How do we learn to control our bodies? There's three ways. There's many different ways. But I'm going to give you three. One is filters. How do we control our bodies? Filters. Okay, whatever your struggle is with sex, whatever your struggle is with with this area, you need to filter out the things you watch. You need to filter out the things you you say. You know, I used to be the kind of person that would say a lot lot of sex jokes, you know, just, ah, laugh about it. And and, and God just really convicted me and said, you know what, Tim, this is, you know, sex is pure. Sex is beautiful. This is what I created. Don't, Don't just joke around about that. So now I'm watching myself to not joke about that. But, but guys... Girls, you, you need to understand this. Not every movie that's, that, that's cool, that, that looks good, is worth watching. 
So what do I do when I see a rated R movie like, oh, this is, cr-. but I'm not saying don't watch rated R movies, but I know my weaknesses. So what I do is I go to um, imdb.com or kidsinmind.com and, um, and I check the movie out and it tells you everything like this nudity, you know, there's this sex scene. And I'm like, nope. If I look at Melinda, I'm like, ah, let's not watch this one. It's not worth it. Why? Because that's going to get into my brain. It's going to, you know, put images in my brain. And I'm going to, you know, most likely fall into sin. And we need to filter out what we watch. And sometimes that means turning off the TV. That sometimes means, you know, we, we need to watch things that are more pure. Another one is accountability. We need other people around us to hold us accountable. Guys, let me tell you this. Christianity is not meant to be lived alone. It's not meant to be lived alone. It never was and never will be. If you don't like people, maybe you don't like big churches. You know, we're small churches. Maybe you don't like big... Man, you're not going to like heaven. Okay, because you're going to be surrounded by Christian people, surrounded by other people who love God. So stop trying alone. Stop thinking that you can do it on your own. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm holy. I can do it on my own. No, you can't. You can't do it on your own. You need someone to walk beside you. You need someone to pray for you and with you. You need that kind of accountability. If you don't have that, seek for it. Man, you know, if your struggle is pornography, if your struggle is watching wrong things, whatever it is, have another Christian brother or sister call you up every week, meet together, and be like, hey, how are you doing in this area? Are you doing better? Are you stopping this? Are you stopping that? Guys, do it. You need it. And the other one is seeking holiness. That's another way we control our bodies. Seek holiness, guys. If you don't seek change, it's not going to happen. If you don't seek God, if you don't pray to God, the change is not going to happen. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Seek after this. Number two, he says in verse four, control his own body and holiness and what? Honor. You need to honor your body. That's verse uh, uh, number two. You need to honor your body. Everyone say honor your body. Nowadays, people use sexuality to identify themselves. They use it to identify themselves. You know, instead of saying, hello, my name is Bob, they go, hello, I'm gay. Uh, no, you have a name. Your sexuality does not define who you are. Hello, I need to get laid tonight or else I'm not a real man. No, that's not what defines your, sexu- uh, your, your identity, okay? D- your identity is in Jesus Christ. Your sexuality does not define you as a person. You, need, you know, that guy, he just needs to keep your pants on and stop acting like a dog. Okay? Honor your body. Women, watch what you wear. Your clothes should be a frame for your face, not your body. Okay? We should be looking at your beautiful face, not your body. 1 Peter 3 says, let us men... Um, of the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. How should women show their beauty? Through their imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, because that is what, how God defines beauty. Women, maybe it's not you, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's other people that you know, if you continually show your body, I'm talking about cleavage, I'm talking about everything, if you continually show that and trying to get attention, the only guys you're going to attract are those who only want you for your body. They're not looking at your true beauty. Men, take care of your pornography problem. I say this because I know the majority of the men either struggle with it or are full-blown addicts. Here are some facts, guys and women. Porn physically changes our brain. Physically changes our brain. Our, Our brain sends out different chemicals whenever we smell something, when we hear something, when we touch something, we feel something, and it sends different chemicals which tells your brain, this is good, this is good for survival, et cetera, et cetera. 
For example, when you hold someone's hand and you care for them, your brain sends out chemicals called oxytocin that tells you this is good. You feel good about holding this person's hand, you should do it again. But with porn, it releases a chemical called dopamine. It releases so much, when you look at porn, it releases so much that the brain begins to take away the receptors in the brain so that it releases less dopamine. So that high that you get when you look at porn, that's dopamine. But then when you keep looking at it, it, it releases less. So what begins to happen? You begin to crave more and harder porn, and then you get to the, you know, to get the same high you need to get, you need to do more and more and more, and that's where the addiction comes in. And the more you use it, the more difficult it is to stop. But you can stop with filters, accountability, and seeking holiness. Amen? Amen. So guys, you need, and women too, you need to figure that out. There's a really cool website that you can get facts. Um, it's www.fightthenewdrug.org. Uh, Fightthenewdrug. Org. And it's awesome. It gives you a lot of awesome facts about what pornography does with relationships and society, how it changes your brain, everything. It's, it's really good for you guys. And number three, he says in verse five, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Number three is sexual sin is associated with people who do not know God. They don't know their creator and don't want to know him. They try to run their own lives and do things on their own. Then they wonder why society and the world is so messed up. Then they have a the nerve to blame God for it. Paul is saying you need to control your body. You need to honor your body and get to know the one who created and designed your body. Amen. Verse six. Verse 6 says, that no, one, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. The question is, is Paul still talking about sexual sin here when he's saying don't wrong a brother, don't take advantage of him? Some commentators say that because of the shift in the Greek grammar, he might be starting a new topic, so he may not talk about sex here. But others say that he is still talking about sex. But regardless, Paul is making it clear that we should not sin against a brother nor cheat him. Why? Because God will avenge. Guys, we're not sure if it's in this life that he's going to avenge or the next life. But the truth is sin has its consequences. And many times those consequences come in this life. And Paul is warning the church, don't mess with sin. Seek holiness. It's not worth it. Then verse 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in what? Holiness. holiness. He has called us in holiness. That is our calling as Christians. We were made to be different. We were made to be separate. Guys, if you have all these non-Christian friends and they don't even know that you're a Christian or they don't even tell a difference, maybe you're not a Christian. You should be the awkward one as a Christian. You should be weird. And that's just a little foreshadowing of our new series that's coming up. Let's get weird, okay? Let's get weird. Christians need to be a little weird. Because we're called to be holy. We're called to be separate and different from the world. The world is going one way and Christians are going the opposite way. And that is tough. Christianity is not easy. And I'm not telling you, you know, the people who came here the last two weeks, guys, five people came to Christ. That's awesome. But guys, I'm telling you guys right now, those who came to Christ, it's not easy. It's not an easy road. But it's a road that is worth it. And we're here with you as a family. It's worth it. Verse 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit in you. Wow. Paul once again says that he's speaking under the authority of God himself. Sometimes we hate it when we hear a sermon that convicts us or makes us feel bad or makes us feel guilty. So we leave that church and go to another church because there, oh, you know, I feel good every service. That's what I want. 
Show me the love, Tim. Tell me sermons that make me feel good. We don't want to hear the truth. See, Paul is saying accept it or reject it, but it will be God's words that you will be accepting and rejecting. So, Tim, you're telling me if I mess up once, that's me rejecting God? No, not necessarily. The word disregard here that he's using in verse 8, it means a settled attitude. It's not just a single incident of disobedience. See, these are those Christians who know it's wrong to have sex, but do not plan to stop. These are Christians who know they shouldn't be living with their girlfriend or boyfriend, but are not making any step toward marriage whatsoever. It's an attitude of rejecting God, of rejecting what he has for us. And notice that Paul says that God gives us the Holy Spirit. He's not saying he gave you the Holy Spirit. He's saying he gives you the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means it's a process. It means that we're not going to be, you know, I accept Jesus and all of a sudden we're going to be this superhuman, you know, Christian that knows everything and is all powerful. No, it's a process. And when we seek the Holy Spirit, when we seek God, he continually fills you with him. He continually fills you with his power. And then you're able to change and then you're able to change the way that you were. Now we come to the last portion of this passage and Paul ends his idea by talking about how we should treat other Christians and also how we should live with non-Christians. So let's read verse 9 through 10. He says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Okay, Paul is saying this. Oh, guys, I know this sounds repetitive. I don't even need to tell you this. Because you're doing so well. But guys, do this more and more. Love other Christians more and more. Seek God more and more. Because guys, this church was loving. They loved other churches. It was an awesome thing they were doing. Now, there's something I discovered that I found to be so awesome, guys. I, I needed to hear this because this is really cool, okay? If you don't think it's cool, then maybe I'm just a geek, okay? Do you see in verse 9 where it says, you yourselves have been taught by God? Okay? Taught by God. Do you know in the Greek, in the original language of the Bible, this is actually a compound word, meaning it's one word made up of two words. And the word in Greek is theodidactoi. Theodidactoi. Everyone say that. Theodidactoi. All right, y'all speaking, y'all speaking Greek. Okay, this word is made up of two words. The first word is theos, which is God. And the second word is didasko, which means to teach. So theodidactoi means taught by God. Okay, and this is the only time this word appears in the New Testament. And it's the earliest time it's used in all of Greek literature. Okay, so this is so cool because I think Paul created this word, okay? Because he doesn't even know how to express what he wants to say. So he's like, Theo the Dactoi, okay? And pretty much this word is God taught, okay? God taught. Everyone say God taught. Okay, so it, it's a predicate adjective, which means this. It's an adjective, meaning it, it describes a noun, and it's related to the subject of the sentence in an equalitative sense. Tim, English, please? Okay, this is what it means. You equals cool. Like, cool is an adjective, right? Like, you're cool, right? You equals cool. In the same way, he's saying you equals God taught. That's awesome. I don't know about you guys. I was just like, what? Okay, so, so he's saying, he's describing the church. He's describing them and saying, you're cool, man. You're awesome. You're faithful. But I'm going to add, I'm going to invent another word. You're God taught. You're God taught. Guys, are you God taught? Are you theodidactoi? Are you God taught? Because I can be here screaming my head off every weekend and, and teaching you guys and teaching you guys. But if you're not seeking God... If you're not doing your homework at home, if you're not, you know, dis disciplining yourself and getting on your knees in prayer and, and reading the Bible, you're not going to be theodidactoi. I can't use that adjective on you. You need God to teach you through your trials, through your suffering. 
Those are the times when we need to go through him, to him, and he will make you theodidactoi, God taught. When we seek holiness, God teaches us to love our brothers, and love isn't something you learn from a sermon. It's something only God can give you. And then verse 11, he says this, And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. So he, the first one he says, live quietly. Tell the person next to you, be quiet. Tell the other person, be quiet. Don't say shut up, that's rude. I know you want to, like, oh, this is my chance, okay? Now he's saying live quietly, not in the gospel, not in boldness, not in telling people about Jesus, but in learning to be quiet instead of continuing arguments. Learning to say I'm sorry and asking for forgiveness. Christians who don't shut up are those who always want to win debates. They just want to argue their doctrine and they lose focus on the Great Commission. They just want to tell you, no, my doctrine is correct, Tim. And they just want to debate and debate and they don't shut up. And Paul is saying, be quiet. Live quietly. The other thing is, mind your own business. Tell the other person next to you, mind your own business. Okay? Mind your business. Some people in this church in Thessalonica, they stopped working. Why? Because they figured, oh, Jesus said he's going to come back soon. So why am I going to work? I mean, why am I going to apply to a job and work if he's going to come? Like, no. So what they started doing, they started being busybodies, okay? They started going around, started gossiping, like, oh, no, man, there's nothing to do, man. So, you know, they started going around and just, like, not minding your own business, pretty much, okay? So he's saying, mind your own business. So they spent all of their time in the affairs of other people, the church leaders, and simply not doing anything that mattered. They're probably playing Floppy Bird all day or something. For those who didn't watch my video, you're like, what is he talking about? Okay. There's a quote that says, an idle brain is the devil's workshop. An idle brain is the devil's workshop. Guys, Christians cannot be bored. Don't let yourself be bored. Because the moment you're bored, that's when the devil starts working in your mind. That's when he begins to tempt you. He begins to put things in your mind. That's when he begins to tell you lies so that you can confront the leadership of the church and you know, try to dismount, try to take over, try to change things in the church. That's when he uses people. And can Satan use Christians? Yes, he can. He used Peter to go against Jesus. We can't have an idle mind. Um, from Christianity Today, there was a congregation in Wakita, Kansas, that had asked the, they, they asked the court to stop four of the members from disrupting services. <laughs> These four members, they would go around, they would run around the, the, the sanctuary, moaning and shouting out. Sometimes they would try to shut the Bible of the pastor or take his mic and hit him on the head. The police would have to step in several times. The church went from... 600 people down to 50. And the police said the trouble apparently stems from a battle over control of the church. Paul is saying, let the leaders of the church lead the church. Okay? These, there are people in churches who are trying to literally close the pastor's Bible and saying, Tim, or pastor, or whatever, you shouldn't be preaching that. Or you should be preaching this. Or, or you should be doing that. Trying to control him like a puppet. It's easier for that to happen to younger pastors like me because they think, oh, Tim, you know, he's not even 26 yet. I'm going to manipulate him and, you know, use him to do what I want to do in the church. But let me tell you guys, God called me to the ministry when I was a young boy. And I'm leading, teaching, and preaching under the authority of God. Under the authority of God. So church, trust me when I say that I am leading under his authority. I love hearing input. I love hearing suggestions. But when I sense that someone is trying to manipulate me in any sort of way, trying to get their own way, I need to stand my ground and go with what God has given me. And I applaud my dad for doing that. 
because he can care less if people leave the church and people talk behind his back. He stands firm to what scripture says. And he's an example for me to do the same. And then last one, he says, work with your hands. And I'm not going to really get into this. We talked about this through the whole We're Giving series about working with your hands. Let's not be, um, um, you know, lazy and, and not work and take advantage of the government. And uh, we talked about that several weeks ago. Last verse, verse 12. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So that you may walk properly before outsiders, non-Christians, non-believers. Why should we live this way? So that we don't make the church look bad and Christ look bad. Guys, I am so tired of people who label themselves Christians just because they know how to step into a church service. But when they are out in the world, they do nothing but slander the name of Jesus. Guys, do you know where the name Christian came from? It was an insult at first. When the first Christians lived for God, when they preached, other outsiders, they called them little Christs. But they said it to mock them, to make fun of them. Ah, look, it's like little Christ. Ah, ha, ha. And they were proud of that name. Like, yeah, we're little, we're little Jesus. Why? Because they walked, they looked, they behaved. Their attitude was just like Jesus. They were weird. They were awesome people. They were holy. Please, do the church a favor and count the cost of being a true Christian before you call yourself one. Guys, we need to be holy. We need to be different. We need to be completely distinguished from the world. I'm not talking about new Christians who are just starting out and, and they're slowly changing. That takes time. I'm talking about people who have been in church a long time, but there's no fruit at all. And God calls that lukewarm. Meaning it's not hot or cold, it's lukewarm. Ever drink lukewarm coffee? It's gross. You spit it out of your mouth. And God says that in, in Revelation that he spits lukewarm people out of his mouth. Why? Because he's disgusted. Guys, you're either 100% for God or 100% for Satan. And that's a reality check for many of us. We need to seek God. The reason why you're weak spiritually, for those of you who are, is because you're not seeking to be holy. You really don't want to be different. You like the idea of Christianity, but not the idea of living differently. You like the idea of a Savior, but not the idea of letting go of what that Savior died for. And you won't want to unless you fall on your knees and beg God to change your heart. This church probably struggled with sexual sin, but what is our struggle here at Pure Word? Is it sexual sin too? Or maybe it's putting up a front. Pretending your spiritual life is fine when really you're dying. You're not fooling anyone. You're just fooling yourself. You need to open up and isolating yourself will only hurt you. And that's what life group is for. Life group is for us to get together and talk about life and open up and say, hey, I'm struggling with porn. Hey, you know, I'm... If I'm in an affair, hey, I have anger issues, hey, you know, I have homosexual desires, hey, whatever it is, we can't put up a front. Or maybe it's the lack of reading the Bible and prayer and praying. Discipline. Well, today, we're going to pass out devotionals for everyone. And I'm sorry we took so long to do this, but we have our daily bread that we're going to pass out. One of the best questions a pastor or Christian can hear from someone is this. Hey, I'm struggling in my spiritual life. Can you help me get strong? Can you pray for me? Do you know how many times I've heard that question? Too few. Too few. And I don't want to put John Carl's on the spot, but sometimes he randomly calls me and asks me to pray for him. And it's funny, it's the ones who ask for help that are actually the strong and mature Christians. And the ones who think they're strong, they don't ask for help and they're not mature and they're not strong.
So we're going to pass out, oh, I'm going to ask John Carlos and Manny to, to come up. We're going to pass out these devotionals. And this is awesome. It's for you to have um, no charge at all. It's really cool because every three months they send these out. And each person gets one. If you want another one to give to a friend, you can ask for two. So when they go by, you can ask for two. I want to give to a friend or uh, you know, my spouse or, or whatever. Um, and these devotionals, it's once a day. It's a small portion of reading. You read some of the scripture, and then there's a little devotional for you to meditate on. And it's really awesome. And I want you guys to begin to seek God if you haven't done so already. S start seeking God um, for holiness, seeking his face. And also, um, you're going to see there, if you open it up, there's going to be a Bible reading plan. So if you haven't started yet, you can just start right, you know, right where it is, February 2nd. You can do the first one today when you get home. Um, and you're going to tell you, actually, let me grab one. I don't have any. Okay. Um, but it's going to tell you the chapters for you to read that day. Um, so you can start doing that um, and, and really begin to see God and holiness. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Let's pray and um, we're going we're gonna to have communion. Bow your heads and, and close your eyes and, and reflect on what you learned today. Maybe it hit you, maybe it didn't, maybe it convicted you, maybe it was just more of an encouraging sermon. Whatever, wherever you are right now, run to Jesus. Whatever struggle you're going through right now, open up, don't let it in. Confess to Jesus, but confess to a brother Confess to a sister. You can confess to me. I'm no one to judge you. I'm only here to help and help you through your struggles. Let's pray. Lord, we're crying out as your children. We're crying out as people who love you. And Lord, we just want to say we need you. Lord, we need you right now. We need your presence. We need your Holy Spirit to change who we are. And Lord, we're all going through some sort of struggle. We all have a sin that we need to let go of. We all have something that we might be hiding. And Lord, I pray that you can help us so we can be holy, like you are holy. That we can turn away from sin, even though it's so hard, even though it's so different from the world. Lord, we want to do this. We want to be weird. We want to be holy for you. Lord, give us that help, the guidance that we need to accomplish this. And those, Lord, who aren't here, who should be here, Lord, those who are sick, Lord, I pray for them. Those who, who haven't been coming for a long time and we don't know why, Lord, I pray that you can reach their heart right where they are, that you can convict them, Lord, so they can come here and receive your word that they may change. Lord, I pray for the new believers, Lord, who gave their life the past two weeks. Lord, that you may be with them, Lord, that you may not discourage them, Lord. Keep encouraging them and empowering them to live this Christian life as hard as it may be. That you may surround them with other Christian brothers and sisters to help them and encourage them. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.